I press admit all, so people are getting admitted. <clears throat> good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Legal Chat, all about the bar. It's February 16, 2020. Hi, Ria. Good morning. I'm good seeing morning, a lot Rhea. of familiar names. Ria, Rina, um, Tiara. Hi, Tiana. Shri, Meredith, Beth. Um, so nice to see you guys again. I feel like we have our, we are always seeing the same people. So that's awesome. I'm loving it. Yeah. So for now, while we're waiting for everyone to get in, why don't you go ahead and state where you're watching from. And also if you are taking the bar exam, let us know if you're taking it this year or when you're planning on taking it. If it's coming up anytime soon, let us know. Hi, Jared from Louisiana. Toronto. Hi, Rhea. Rhea from Toronto. Alabama, nice. Texas. Got Beth. Ava from California. And Shri from Seattle. Rena, good morning from California. Yay. So is anyone taking the bar this February or anytime soon? Let us know so we can provide you with some additional information while we're here or some uh, last minute tips. <laughs> and we'll start probably like 1034, Catherine? Yes. In a couple minutes? Okay. Okay. So, so where are you all in your legal journey? Um, let us know too. Are you high schooler, um, in college? Um, oh, great, Rena 2022, nice. Ooh, that's great. awesome. We have high school, high school, junior in college, undergrad, junior, high school, high school senior, teen college classes, senior in college, Middle schooler. Wow, you guys are really dedicated. I love it. Yeah, Jared, great job. Very impressed. And if you guys want to turn on your um, your video, we'd appreciate seeing your faces as well. We love seeing your faces. Just saying hi real quickly. Jared, thank you for turning on your video. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi, Meredith. Thanks for turning on your camera. And no pressure if you don't want to turn on your camera. It's just nice to see your faces. So yeah, no pressure at <laughs> no, all. No pressure. <laughs> all right, one more minute. I like your headset, Jared. <laughs> all right. One more minute to let everyone in. There you go. Okay. And as, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, so I'll be admitting most people and it's 1034. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, as you know, my name is Catherine Lazardo, and, um, and Tally Goody is here as well. Go ahead, Tally. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so excited you guys are here. So we'd love to introduce our guests for today. Today, we're talking all about the bar exam. So we have two guests from Kaplan. We have Lisa Young and Diana Quigley, who will be um, not on the camera, but she is going to be here helping with Q&A. So Lisa, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and we can get started. Yeah, and actually Lisa, so sorry if I yes. can interrupt you real quickly. I just wanted to let everyone know that we'll do the usual format, which is Lisa will be presenting. And then if you can please hold off on your questions until the end, um, but you can type in your questions on the chat so that we can see what your questions are and we'll address them at the end of um, the, the episode about 15 minutes before. Thank you guys. 
Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And I, I love that it's a full range in your learning journey and thinking about the, the bar exam, even in middle school is pretty amazing. Um, I am the executive director of academics at Kaplan Bar. And I help students prepare for the bar exam, but I also work with students pre-law and all throughout law school. And um, I've been preparing students for the bar and teaching in the, the legal environment for 20 years now, um, this spring, it's been 20 years. And I absolutely love it. I love the intersection of law and teaching. And I really, really love helping students realize their full potential and realize their dreams. Um, and sometimes these dreams feel a little um, outside of what we think we can really grasp. And I love helping students see that you can grasp them and there's lots of ways and strategies you can put into place um, to make those dreams a reality. So I'm excited to be here today. And um, as Catherine said, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. I can answer them. Um, at the end of the presentation, because I want to make sure that you get the most out of the presentation. Um, there's, again, a lot of uh, a variation in the audience today. So I'm going to try to hit some high level points. But if you have specifics that you have questions about, um, you know, really legal education in general or the bar exam, I'm an expert. So please feel free to ask um, while I'm here with you today. Um, the goals of the session, and these are somewhat based on um, questions that I often get from individuals like yourself, but also some myths that are out there that I like to kind of debunk or at least explain. Um, and uh, one is, you know, what is the bar exam? So what exactly is it? Um, a lot of people have misconceptions about it, and I'll give you um, some information around it. Why is the bar exam so hard? I am the first one to admit the bar exam is pretty hard. It's a hard test. And so I'm not going to, to lie or candy coat that. Um, it is a difficult test. And I'm going to explain why it's so hard. Um, and then I'm going to kind of jump into, uh, you know, really kind of turn that around into something a little bit more positive. Um, but first, you know, talking about, you know, this myth of, is it true that everybody passes or, or excuse me, everybody fails the exam? Um, and that's, I'll just give you a little teaser. It's not true. Um, so I'll explain that um, a bit and then also give some tips and strategies, um, methodologies that we use and we help students employ to be successful on the exam. So these are, these are the main goals of the session, but again, um, we'll cover a couple different things throughout and um, essentially my goal is to really empower you and give you some information that allows you to seek out additional information and allows you to feel confident if this is a journey that you want to, to, to begin. So if we're on the way to the bar, actually not this kind of bar, right? Not that kind of bar. We're actually gonna go on this path to the bar. Um, it's funny, my, my daughter, um, always thought when I said, oh, I'm helping people with the bar, you know, she was little and she didn't understand well, what is the bar? And it, it does feel a little kind of amorphous, especially to a child. Um, so she always envisioned it was some sort of, um, you know, restaurant or bar environment. So, no, actually it's a very different type of bar and it requires a lot of work. And there's several steps that you need to take along the way in order to get there. Um, and a lot of you are even kind of way before this in your learning journey, but as you approach uh, really thinking uh, about those next steps and, and leading into a career in law, um, the first thing you'll do is take the LSAT. The LSAT is a standardized test. I believe some of you probably already know about it. Um, some of my colleagues um, talked to you about it um, earlier um, in one of these sessions. And um, it's, it's a standardized test, much like other standardized tests that you've taken. And that is the entrance exam that you will take when you are applying for law school. Law school then is your next step. Law school is um, a challenging endeavor. It's typically three to four years and helps you to prepare for the bar exam, but not completely. So when you are in law school, you're learning some of the content and skills that you'll need for the bar exam, but you'll need to do some additional study. We call that the bar review period. And that's my specialty. And what we do here at Kaplan is provide uh, 
a course that really ushers you into that next step, which is preparing for the bar exam. And the bar exam leads you to licensure or practicing law. And um, most, if not all jurisdictions require that bar exam for licensure. So it's something that if you want to practice law, um, that is the traditional route to doing so. So what exactly is the bar exam, right? There's, there's sometimes some questions around that and it is a standardized test. So it's much like a lot of the standardized tests that you've taken in the past. Um, and I know that you've probably taken several um, depending on where you are in your learning journey. Um, and it's created by the National Conference of Bar Examiners, um, NCBE is uh, the, the common acronym. And it's also created by State Board of Bar Examiners. So it depends on your state because lots of states have different um, aspects to their exams. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so when you are considering the bar exam, you should really first consider where do you wanna live? Where do you wanna practice? And what, how does that impact the exam that you'll be taking? Um, because that can give you some useful information. Again, I'll give you some of that information here today. Um, it's designed to test your knowledge of the law. And it's also test, it's testing your knowledge um, from a skills-based perspective. So it's really knowledge and skills that uh, jurisdictions feel really important for individuals to know as they become lawyers. They want to make sure that you have the competencies in place to become a lawyer and uh, really they're protecting the public. They want to make sure that when you have clients that you are um, uh, really exhibiting the high level of content and skills that you need. Also professionalism, which we'll, we'll talk uh, briefly about. Some of you have probably um, thought through like, how does COVID and quarantine and all of the different um, issues that we've had this last year, how does that really impact uh, the bar exam? And I will say, wow, last summer was a roller coaster ride and not the kind that you're laughing the whole time. Kind kind of that you're screaming most of the time. So, uh, but the, the great thing is that we've really, we've passed through that and now, um, while it's not the same as it ever was, it is um, much more um, under, understood and the process is much more transparent. Um, and so that really helps students to understand what to expect um, and how to prepare. Um, it helps jurisdictions to make sure that the exams are fair and reliable and valid and that everything's gonna work as planned. Um, and so some of the changes that did occur um, and probably the most significant is that um, a lot of the exams, not every state, but most states and most exams went from an in-person test to an online exam. I, I'm going to be real here with you. I have been doing this for 20 years and that was a big jump. That was a really big jump. And so going from an in-person exam to an online exam was especially because it all happened very last minute. Students now kind of moving forward um, for this winter's bar, as well as the summer, um, have been informed that, hey, your exam most likely will be online. And that gives students, again, that empowers students with that knowledge to understand how to best prepare and make sure that they are doing all of the other pieces uh, to make sure that they are prepared for this online um, exam change. These other pieces are listed here. So software, it's not necessarily different software, but it has different features and um, maybe acts a little bit differently than it used to. Um, oftentimes it's exam soft. Oftentimes students use that type of software in law school. And so it's not a huge jump in terms of acclimating to that environment, that software and online testing environment. Um, there's absolutely security measures put in place. Um, there's a lot of security measures put in place for the online exam. and so. You know, it's it's obvious that they would want to also put those same security measures in place. Um, it's a what we call a high stakes test, right? It's it's you pass and you become a lawyer. You fail, you don't get to become a lawyer. Now you do have options to take another exam and and maybe go to other jurisdictions and whatnot, but it's a high stakes exam, and so there are um, very strict security measures in place. I would say those security measures um, last summer, again, were a little bit bumpier than they are moving forward. And so um, there's that evolution in terms of how the exam has been administered and, and really understanding the modality and the features of the software and how those security measures can be, again, fairly um, implemented. 
Um, another big change that um, students, I think, worry more about, but is less of um, an issue once they really kind of acclimate to that is um, going from a paper exam or paper scratch paper to a virtual exam and virtual scratch paper. Um, and so what we have done at Kaplan is provide students with a lot of resources and information about and strategies about how they can really switch up their approach. So if they were thinking about completing the exam on paper, they um, now have strategies and, and kind of tools to implement to use their virtual scratch paper. And oftentimes we found that um, in talking with students um, after their exam administration last summer, and also just our students who are preparing now, they're finding that it's actually saving them some time as they're completing the exam. And so sometimes there's silver linings, right? We're finding a lot of silver, silver linings in a lot of things these days. Um, and then lastly here, content changes. There were some content changes based on states. So I'm not going to kind of dive into that right now, but yes, COVID related content changes did happen. Um, it was really state um, generated. And so it depended on the state and, and what the, the specific state bars um, tried to do and mostly did successfully was really make those, again, those changes transparent and give those to students. Um, that has been much um, more a, of a smooth process this winter than last summer. Um, and I'm imagining the, the move forward will also be much more, uh, much smoother process. Um, so these are some common acronyms that I'm probably going to throw around a little bit in this presentation. Um, I already said NCBE for National Conference of Bar Examiners. We have the MBE, which is the multi-state bar exam. It's the multiple choice section of the exam. The MEE, which is the multi-state essay exam. That's part of the written test. Um, the MPT, which is the multi-state performance test. Um, I'm going to talk about the MBE and the MEE a little bit. I'm not going to dive into the performance test um, in this session. Um, might be my favorite section of the exam, but it's um, one that requires a lot more depth. Um, and then the UBE is the Uniform Bar Exam, and I'm going to explain that a little bit in terms of um, kind of going back to where do you want to take the bar and what exam are you going to be taking because it does vary based on the states. And so I'll dive into that a little bit. Um, and then the MPRE is actually a separate test. Um, it is a multi-state professional responsibility exam, which students can take even prior to graduation from law school. Um, most states require that. And again, they have varying um, kind of passing scores depending on the state. Um, and that of course is uh, related to professionalism and ethics um, in the legal profession. So um, obviously a very important test. Um, and all of these acronyms and all of these tests are registered trademarks of the National Conference of Bar Examiners. Um, Kaplan and, and myself, we are not um, endorsing or affiliated with the National Conference, um, but they will be appearing uh, throughout um, this presentation. And I wanted to give you that um, information so you know what all those different pieces are. Um, so why is the bar exam so hard? Um, and, and again, and I'll go back to, it is really hard. It's a hard test. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. And um, if I had to sit down and do the bar exam uh, right now, I would say, yeah, it's still a challenge. Um, and, and I'd probably get a little nervous because that's natural. Um, but, but why is it hard? And how can, you know, I'm gonna then springboard into how can we really tackle it and make sure that we are confident test takers um, and use the anxiety or um, that stress to really propel us into some positive action. Um, so it's hard because it's three types of questions. So I just went through those acronyms. We have multiple choice, essay, and performance test on most state bars. And that means you're preparing content, like memorizing a lot of content, but you have to um, really synthesize that content and be able to practice through different test modalities. So that makes it a little bit challenging because you have the multiple choice, multiple choice essay and performance test. Um, there's also uh, this little thing called all of these different subjects. Um, so there's a lot of content that's tested. Um, this is a kind of snapshot view of the uniform bar exam. And this is, we call this the, the bar exam breakdown. And this really gives you um, a picture of what the exam um, is comprised of and um, how it's scored, which again, 
It's all about empowering um, you to understand the test because if you can become more like the test maker instead of the test taker, you're gonna have so much more confidence. You're gonna kind of see behind that curtain and you're gonna understand what this test is all about. And it's going to be less daunting and less scary and you're gonna really be able to Kind of control it instead of having it control you, which is really important when you're when you're approaching the bar. Um, so the uniform bar exam, um, you can see all of these orange states here. Those are UBE or uniform bar exam jurisdictions. Um, those states all administer the same exact test. So um, if you take, I'm in Washington state, so hello out there to whoever else is in Seattle. I am too, very dreary today. Um, and if you take the, the bar here in Washington, you can go to these other orange states if you get a high enough score and transfer in to those states. So that's really beneficial because we know that the, um, the, the portability of scores allows for us to really kind of move about the country and figure out where we might want to practice a lot next or allow us to practice somewhere for a, a short time. And then um, maybe we we decide, oh, we found a job that we like better or we want to move closer to family um, or wow, I'm really sick of all of this rain in Seattle and you want to move to a different state. All of these states in orange have adopted the uniform bar exam and kind of more are, are kind of on, on board um, each and every cycle. So another aspect of why the exam is so challenging is because there's a lot of content. There's a lot of content on the test. And um, one section of the exam is the multi-state bar exam, which I mentioned, and that is the multiple choice section of the exam. And you'll see here seven subjects that are tested. Now, good news is, for those of you who have not been to law school yet, most, if not all of these subjects are required courses in law school. So it's not like you're gonna take the test um, at the end of this whole learning journey and you haven't seen these, uh, these subjects before. All of these, um, most of these and most law schools are required subjects. And if not, they're at least offered as electives. Um, and then the multi-state essay exam tests all of those subjects in the first column and also tests all of the subjects in this second column. Now, these subjects are not always required. So some students will choose to take them because they wanna make sure that they're prepared for the bar exam or maybe just prepared for legal practice, right? It's nice to have an idea of family law issues, even if you don't plan to practice family law. It's also a great idea to know some business association issues. Again, even if you don't plan to be a transactional attorney and practice in the, the business association world. So students often take those subjects for the, the very reason that they'll be tested on the bar exam, but also because they are um, just kind of great ones to know when you say, hey, I'm an attorney and you're at a, uh, you know, a, a soiree with friends and they're gonna say, oh, by the way, I was thinking about you know, this business issue that just came up. Um, and it's nice to just have a little bit of background to be able to have that conversation. Um, so these are all of the subjects that are tested. And again, that is why this exam is so difficult because you have a, a lot of content, not just those um, different types of testing. So I'm also showing California. I know a lot of you are um, uh, potentially based in California. And so I wanted to give you uh, just a little bit of how states can vary um, from the uniform bar exam. So these are, this California is a state that was not in orange on that, uh, that picture of the map. Um, and you'll see that uh, they have some state specific content um, it, for half of their exam, and then half of their exam is the MBE, which again is that multiple choice section of the exam. Um, the multiple choice section is always the same across all of the states, orange states and not orange states. Um, and then the second uh, column here is the California bar exam subjects. And so these subjects are state specific subjects, meaning the content is related to the laws that are. Um, just in California. Um, so some of those laws will um, overlap, but then there's going to be some state specific um, legal content within all of those subjects. And there's also a couple extra subjects. So just FYI, the California bar is a tough one, um, but we can get you through it. <laughs> um, so that transitions to 
really um, this question or this myth. Is it true that most people fail the bar exam? You know, short answer is no. Um, do students fail? Yes, it's a tough test. And we all have lots of different um, learning needs. We have lots of different things going on in our lives that can affect our test taking. Um, so yes, individuals fail the exam. But what we have found is that 93% of our students pass the exam when they do 75% of the assigned work. And so what I do and my team does is create an assign a syllabus that assigns work that we know is essential for bar passage. So what does a student absolutely need to learn and know and practice and feel confident in in order to, to, to pass the exam? And if they do at least 75% of that work, they're gonna pass at a 93% rate. And um, I um, could, I'm pretty safe to say, there's no state pass rates at 93%. It is impossible to have a 93% um, uh, percent pass rate, um, or it's maybe not impossible, but it's improbable. Um, so oftentimes pass rates um, really go from anywhere from 40 or 45% to 75, 80%, maybe 85% on the high end. Um, so this is really, um, you know, this kind of debunks that myth that like everybody fails and it's a test that's, you know, completely impossible. It's not impossible. We can all do hard things, right? That's the, the, the thing that we've probably all been telling ourselves this last year. Um, and, and there's lots of ways to do it. Um, and so that really helps me help you springboard into how could you increase your chances of passing the bar exam? And I know some of you are not anywhere near taking the bar exam. And so what I would say is you can really open this up and think about just becoming an expert in your own learning and the road to your success, no matter what that road is, right? So this road could be the road to law school. This road could be the road to the bar exam, but this could also just be the road to college or road to finishing high school. Um, it's all about becoming an expert in your own learning and really having a positive and strategic mindset. And I'll talk about um, I'll talk about those um, first, a little humor. Um, you know, what if I told you it's not how long you study, it's how well you study. Um, oftentimes we think that we have to study, you know, 24 hours a day and we have to pull the all-nighters and we have to, you know, just devote our entire lives to study, study, study. And that's really not the case. It's really about um, figuring out what you need to know and how you learn best. Um, it's about planning and not cramming. Right. When you cram, you're likely to miss out on a really um, important learning opportunity. And um, our brains just aren't wired to fit all of this information in. Um, so you can't cram for the bar. It's just not possible. There's too much information. We encourage students to study for at least 10 weeks for the bar exam because there's that much information um, to to really kind of remember from law school and also relearn or learn for the first time. Um, creating a study schedule that, and this 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 really um, can, can flow through all sorts of learning environments, um, but creating a study schedule um, that includes time to memorize, to practice and review. And it's, it's part of the self-regulated learning cycle because if you're just spending time memorizing, but you don't actually practice or apply what you've learned, then you're not going to be able to perform. You're not going to be able to see the relevancy of that information. So practicing, practicing not only in a testing environment, but practicing in other ways so that you have a full understanding of the information and not just a, a memory of it. Um, and then this piece, this review, um, a lot of students kind of are not as, um, you kind of on board with uh, doing review or self-reflection. And um, so I think it's a something that's changing and I think people are much more open to it now, but it is something that is so important in that self-regulated learning cycle and really understanding who you are as a learner uh, because it's not about um, the test, it's about you, right? It's about what you know and what you need to know. Knowing what the test is all about empowers you and gives you that information but you really need to know yourself. Um, and, and lastly here, part of exam preparation is employing a positive and strategic mindset. So if you go into a test and you say, I'm gonna fail, I'm really bad at tests, um, that is a fixed mindset. 
it's not positive. That's pretty negative, right? If you're approaching a test and you're telling yourself you're going to fail, um, likelihood is you, you might fail. <laughs> so going into a test with a positive and strategic mindset will really help uh, make that a more positive experience and increase your likelihood of passing. There's actually a lot of research, educational research in this area. And um, a lot of what we do throughout our courses is help students really feel that positive and strategic mindset. Again, I can say all of these positive things to you, but you have to feel it, you have to embody that. I'll talk more about that at the end. Um, so um, study schedules. So yes, you have to plan and not just cram. Um, and this is just one way to think about what your day would look like when you're sitting for the bar. Um, it's a difficult test and we want you to pass. We wanna increase your likelihood of passing. So it's all about planning and preparing and making sure that you have, um, you're using your time um, in an efficient way. So again, just one snapshot of what that might look like. Um, sleep is so important, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is something throughout our lives, whether you're in middle school or whether you're approaching retirement, it's really important um, to, for our brain and our brain health and, um, and for learning. And so I would say work on your sleep schedule if you, if you know that that's an issue. Um, so how to study for and pass the bar exam, I really put this in two buckets, knowing the law, so really understanding it and being able to memorize it and really kind of knowing the law and those concepts, and then showing what you know. So you can't have one and, and pass the exam, you really have to have both in order to pass. Because if you just memorize the law, but you haven't been able to work on that practice and really showing what you know, then you're not going to get the, the scores you need. And this really, again, um, kind of can flow into other, other pieces of your life and, and learning um, in the, a work environment or in a learning environment. Um, I love this um, picture because it shows that, um, you know, while these are all chocolate chip cookies, um, they're all really different, right? And we're all kind of going, oh, I really like number two, or, oh, I really like, you know, 10 looks good to me, right? And so we, we're all different chocolate chip cookies. And I never, ever um, approach a student or approach a class or a presentation um, or a curriculum or creating a syllabus thinking that everyone is chocolate chip cookie number one, because then I would fail as an educator and most likely what, uh, you know, cookies number two to 12 are gonna fail too because the curriculum and the approach um, and the design hasn't really uh, been, you know, th those, those cookies haven't been taken into consideration. And so it's really important to understand what are your learning styles? What are your learning preferences? And it doesn't mean that you're, you're only one thing. Most of us are multimodal. Most of us like to kind of learn things in lots of different ways. But some of us really know, like, if I read something, I might forget it right away. Or some of us, the, the flip side, maybe if you read it, you have kind of a, a visual memory of that, and it really helps you. So understanding your unique recipe for success is really important. And if you don't know it, then reflecting on it and really seeking out that help um, because there's lots of ways uh, to determine that and then to really gear your, your studying and your approaches to those learning studies, learning um, styles and preferences. Um, we at, at Kaplan are really huge proponents of active learning because, oh my gosh, how boring is it if you just sit in a lecture all day and you're not actually trying to try things out and put things into practice and see how things come alive. And so it's all about formative assessment and really figuring out like what you're doing well, what you need to work on, because if you're doing certain things really well and you kind of have a great handle on it, you don't need to spend as much time on those things. Whereas if you know that there's some aspects that you need to work on, then you need to kind of work on um, remedying those kind of deficiencies. Thinking about how you can capture all of the content that you need, um, again, through different modalities. Um, a lot of students learn really well through a lecture. A lot of students learn really well through reading an outline 
a lot of other students might prefer to learn through doing questions and practice. Um, and then guided review is always kind of the, the number one way to learn because you are learning from someone who is showing you how to learn. Um, and so we do a lot of that throughout our course. And I would say, I'm sure a lot of you in middle school and high school and undergrad um, are, are, are actually kind of doing a lot of these different pieces in your um, learning environments as well. So I'm going to go through um, the Kaplan method for essay versus multiple choice. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, again, a lot of you are not in law school necessarily. Um, but I'm just going to give you a high level of different approaches. And so um, law school exams, uh, you know, we kind of equate to kind of the Escalade. Um, bar exam essays are really the, the NASCAR and it gets even faster guys. We get to answering MCQs and it's like warp speed, like we're Starship Enterprise. So, you know, we're cruising in law school. We have a little bit more time to answer those questions. What a bar exam, it's a time test, right? It's a standardized test. It's a time test. You have two days to complete it, but for an essay, you know, oftentimes you have 30 minutes to an hour, whereas a law school exam, you might have several hours multiple choice questions on the bar. Wow, are you ready for this? 1.8 minutes, okay? So that is not very much time to complete. So it does feel kind of like warp speed. So you have to have an approach. And what we do um, in our course and how I teach is make sure that everyone has a method. And again, we give the method, but we want students to really kind of tweak it to their learning style. Um, we want them to read and think and outline when they're approaching an essay, write using this uh, format called IRAC, where they first state the issue, then the rule, then their analysis, and then their conclusion. This really helps them to stay organized. It helps make sure that they get all of the possible points on those particular questions. This is also the, the method that we would encourage students to use um, in law school as well. Um, and when they're studying for the essay exam, they really kind of need to think about how their study might change because they need to understand the law. They need to be really good at issue spotting. They need to know the law well enough to be able to just recite it and be able to type it out quickly in their exam answer. Um, so they need to test themselves and really practice. We call it practice like you play. So if you're gonna have an essay exam and it's a 30 minute exam, you should be practicing in 30 minutes when you're approaching that exam because you don't want to to say oh i only got you know two paragraphs out and i didn't finish the exam then you're not going to pass and so it's all about really that preparation the mbe focus again it feels like warp speed. Um, it's about really applying those legal principles um, in a dispassionate way. You can't have too much empathy for the characters in these questions because it's really about uh, what is the law and based on the law, how would you answer this question? Again, you only have 1.8 minutes, which makes it um, challenging. Um, the best thing to do is to read the call of the question first. I'll get to that approach in the next slide. Um, and that helps you to identify the legal issue. If you can keep that legal issue at the forefront of your mind as you're working through those facts, then you'll have a much better time at answering the question and um, you'll be more successful. Um, the, the reason why this section of the exam is so difficult is because it, it really tests a wide range of legal rules, their elements, and key exceptions. So sometimes it's exceptions to exceptions, and that gets students kind of in the, in the weeds in terms of content and um, understanding the law. Again, this kind of goes back to one of my previous slides of you know, if we scaffold all of those different pieces for students, then it's easier for them to understand and it's easier for them to be able to demonstrate that understanding. Um, so the approach for uh, multiple choice is to read the call of the question first. And honestly, I would say this is a great approach no matter where you are in your learning journey. So even if you are in middle school or high school, it's great to read that call of the question first. This is kind of a best practice in test taking because then you are going to be able to critically read the fact pattern. And that critical read through means that you're taking your time with the facts to really um, determine that central issue, identify what rules or what's really being tested. Um, and then I want you to go to the answer choices and select um, the best answer. 
So lastly, I want to talk, and I, I say lastly, but it's probably out of everything I have here today, um, not necessarily exactly on point with the bar exam, but it is the most important piece in any sort of learning environment and also probably in um, just our, our lives in general um, is possessing a positive and strategic mindset. Um, I know that for my, my bar students, it is absolutely paramount that they have a positive and strategic mindset. And we really try to infuse that within our course and within all of the individual attention that we give to them because it can make or break their success. Um, so the first piece is really um, gathering useful information. And so a lot of you are doing that today by being in this session, gathering information about the exam, gathering information about kind of you know, what it's all about and what to expect and how to pass and some strategies and approaches, which is great because when you gather that information, you're, you're being empowered. You then know you don't have these big question marks and open um, questions that um, lead you to having insecurity or anxiety or stress. You are empowered. You have the information you need. The next piece is you have to use that information to your advantage. If you know that an exam has 50% multiple choice, then you should really be spending a lot of your time practicing multiple choice questions. Using that information that you've gathered to your advantage will help you find success. And, and lastly, and this is really the most important, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about this because it's really important to me, is believing that you can do it. Um, I often am kind of everyone's biggest cheerleader. I'm like, you can do it, you can do it. And I'm a very positive person, but you have to believe, right? I can tell you all day long that you can pass this test and I don't know you. And a lot of you aren't even close to this. I know you can pass this test and I believe it, but you need to believe it. And whether it's I believe I'm going to go to college and study pre-law, or I believe I'm going to get into law school of my choice and, and do really well and, and maybe get honors, uh, or I believe I'm going to take this bar exam and pass the first time, you have to believe you can do it. And if you have these other steps in place, gathering that information first for that strategy that you need, putting that strategy into place, and then having that, that positive outlook really makes a difference. Um, so how do we possess that positive and strategic mindset? Um, I like to kind of bring in a personal story here. Um, last year, um, uh, when everything kind of shut down, um, it was, there's a lot of uncertainty. We didn't know what was happening in the world. And um, I seemed to have a lot of time on my hands because we couldn't really do anything. And so I borrowed uh, this bike in this picture. And uh, this is beautiful um, Eastern Washington. Um, where I live and I borrowed this bike and honestly, I knew how to ride a bike, but I didn't really know how to ride a bike. And I hadn't been on a bike in a very long time. And I thought, you know, I don't think I could ever be a cyclist. I, I'm, I play soccer, I'm good at a lot of things, um, but I'm not a cyclist and I'll never be a cyclist. And I'm happy to report that I'm a cyclist. And the reason why I'm a cyclist is because I tried and I had a positive and strategic mindset. I started by just getting on the bike and riding and I rode like a mile or two. And I was like, I can't believe I did that. And I was talking to people and they were like, oh, I just went on a 30 mile bike ride. And I said, I don't think I will ever be able to do that. And last night I did a 35 mile bike ride. So the thing is, if you find out all of the, that information that you need, right? I started talking to people. I started watching YouTube videos about biking. I started, um, you know, really examining the bike and how can I get this fit better and, and make sure that I'm more comfortable looking at different routes and which routes work for me, looking at my time and my speed and, you know, which ones I needed to like, you know, do a little bit more work on and gathering that information from lots of different sources, putting that, that information into practice right? Figuring out, okay, I need to go faster here. I need to do this or that and making it work for me. Now I will say I had a couple crashes and I was really, you know, uncomfortable on the bike and I was scared this ride in particular. I was very, very scared, but I, you put yourself out there and you practice and make mistakes 
is how you learn and that's how you grow. Whether it's again, as a middle schooler, a high schooler, undergrad, law student, bar or beyond, right? I'm way out from taking the bar. Um, so we can be lifelong learners um, and, and using those examples from your life because you all have examples. The cycling example is just one that's recent for me, but some of you have approached other things that have seemed really challenging and think about how did you approach it? It doesn't have to just be from a learning environment perspective or from a school environment perspective. Think about how you overcame whatever hurdle that was. You probably talked to people and you got some support and you probably fell down like I did, right? And, and then you got back up and you learned from that experience and then you kept going. And then you find successes or maybe little mini successes along the way. And that's what it's all about. Um, it's, it's not without um, challenge, right? But challenge is what's going to make you stronger and more successful. So when you're thinking about whether it's the bar exam or the, the path or the journey to get you to the bar exam, um, think about you know the fact that it's going to take practice. Um, and you're going to make mistakes, and that's part of that learning learning journey. Um, memorization and practice, those things are vital for bar passage. Um, becoming an expert in your own learning is really important, um, whether it's for the bar or whether it's for other pieces of your, your learning endeavors, but having a positive mindset, that's essential. That's a life skill. That's something that you need no matter what you plan to do, but it's really essential if you are going to take the bar exam. So if that is part of your learning journey, I wish you all the success um, with it. Um, and I know that you can do it and I know that you can pass. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope that there's some questions that I can answer. Um, we have a, a gift here for you. If you are thinking about the, the bar exam, um, then you can, um, you can sign up for our course and uh, we have a discount here. We also have um, a, a, a raffle if you want to be entered into that um, if you are a law student and approaching the bar. Um, so with that, I'll see if there's any question that um, anyone has. Happy to answer them. Lisa, I, there's actually a great question um, on the chat that I wanted to make sure we address as well if other people didn't see it. And that is for the bar, is it a pass or fail or do they get a score um, after they take the test? So the answer is kind of both, um, but yes, you get a score and the score um, is dependent upon the jurisdiction. And um, so the UBE scores are portable. And so they vary anywhere from 260 to 280 for uh, each jurisdiction because each jurisdiction has the um, ability to select their kind of cut score for their state. Um, so if you get a 270 in one state and want to transfer to a state that requires a 280, you can't use your 270. You need to get at least that minimum score. Um, but once you once you take the exam, you you pass or you fail, and that's that's all there is to it. You don't need um, you know you'll you'll get your actual score in most states, but um, it's a, a kind of a pass fail endeavor. Um, and again, the the scoring varies based on the states and whether it's a UBE state or just a state specific uh, exam. But good question. So we have another question here um, from Cece. Would you recommend creating study groups people in order to succeed? So that's a great question. Um, I am a super huge extrovert. I think maybe that comes across um, in, in my presentation style, but I, um, I love talking through things. I love learning from others, but I also love just talking. So there's pros and cons, right? So when you are in a study group, um, I have some kind of rules around and boundaries um, around what that would look like. And I think that those are really healthy and productive for most students. So I would say, um, talking out and having a study group, um, you know, really having study group rules, you know, oh, we're going to meet at this time for this long, you know, each week, and these are our agenda items, just like you would for any other meeting um, in kind of a professional setting. And that way you stay on task. 
And if you want to embed, the first 10 minutes is a catch up, right? Because I haven't talked to anybody for, you know, eight hours and I've been studying, you know, straight and with my books and my, my lectures. And it would be really great to just talk about, you know, something I saw on social media or the, the funniest meme I've ever seen, whatever it is, then sure, put that into your agenda and say the first 10 minutes, we're always going to do kind of a touch base, how we're feeling, what's going on in the world, and then we're going to jump into it. Because um, I say this often when I talk to students about creating schedules, is if you schedule it, it's not procrastination and it's not a distraction, right? If I schedule my Instagram time on, you know, my actual schedule, then I'm not, it's not a slippery slope. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this for 30 minutes. And then after it's over, I'm going to go and do whatever else is on the agenda. So being really uh, clear with the city group about boundaries, I think um, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what the study group could look like otherwise, but generally speaking, the smaller the group, the more productive the group because there's fewer individuals to cause distraction. Distraction. Um, sometimes pairing up with someone who has skills or strengths that you don't have, and vice versa, can be a nice um, uh, complementary uh, relationship. But I think having some. Uh, especially if you're asking the question, you're likely maybe more drawn to that type of learning environment, um, but having some activities in place so that it's not just, oh, we're going to talk about things, but actually do some practice, you know, do a practice question and then talk about it or quiz each other with flashcards or use a whiteboard, obviously, you know, in, in a post-COVID world where you can physically be with individuals. I guess you could probably do it via Zoom. Um, but actually, you know, whiteboarding different things out and really um, talking through things in a uh, productive way can be a great way to, to use a study group. Good and question. If I can, and if I can add to that um, as well, like what Lisa was saying, it depends on what uh, what kind, how you learn. Um, for example, for me, I'm more of, um, uh, I, I learn better when I do it by myself because sometimes when I'm in a group, I get confused with what everyone else is saying. And so uh, what I try to do is I, you know, um, you can, I, I, I do it depending on how I feel about the course. Um, and so you can apply this to in your, in your um, classes is that um, I can go into a group session and then listen to what everyone is saying in case I'm missing something. And then I study by myself so that I can um, uh, immerse myself more or be a sponge more of what I learned from everyone. So think about how you study better. Exactly. Yeah, another uh, kind of to dovetail with that, if you, you know, you have a couple study group sessions and then you walk away and you kind of think, wow, I didn't really learn much from that, then it's probably not going to be working for you. And so it's part of the kind of rules or that that kind of pact you make with the individuals in your group can be, hey, just because I opt out of the study group or I say that, you know, we can't do this anymore, I can't do this anymore, doesn't mean that we can't still be colleagues or friends or, or what have you. Oftentimes I found when I, I was teaching at a, um, a law school before I was here at Kaplan and oftentimes my students weren't necessarily friends with their study group. Um, and that can be a, a really great dynamic, unfortunately, because our friends we want to like talk to and have fun. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, history there. Whereas if you are just meeting with someone to study, then that's part of your, um, you know, that's the, that's the piece of the relationship that um, takes the forefront. We also have another question, which is why is it is the bar exam so expensive? Oh, great question. Um, I don't have, uh, I mean, I don't create the bar exam. So I don't want to speak for the individuals who do. But what I know about the creation of um, standardized tests and bar exams is that it's very expensive to create. So I know um, for tests that, that uh, one test actually that I'm creating right now, it has taken it'll be over two years before we can actually administer the test to, to a group of students because of 
the research, the psychometrics, the actual item writing, items are the questions. Um, it would be really great if we could just write a test and give it to students and it works. But um, again, there's best practices in standardized testing. And one of those best practices or a couple of the best practices are making sure that those tests are reliable, that they're really measuring time after time the, same, the, the thing that we want to measure um, and that they're valid so that um, they're fair in terms of they're not testing something that's outside of the scope or they're not um, appealing to certain groups of students and not to others. And so there's so many different facets in creating and, and test design. Um, that does actually make it quite expensive. Um, so that's part of it. I mean, there's a lot of other pieces that I touched upon a bit in terms of administration and how things have changed. So, you know, software, we do, you know, um, you know, jurisdictions have to license software and or students have to pay licensing fees for software and test creation. Um, so there's different pieces, but I think as with everything, um, there are, you know, anything that's developed, um, you know, thoughtfully and intentionally and with a lot of, um, you know, as I said, it's a high stakes test. Um, it's going to be a costly endeavor. So that cost of creation and um, development um, and testing uh, does unfortunately fall to individuals who want to become licensed. And if I can just follow up on that, um, how much is it to, to um, take the bar prep courses and how much is the bar ex itself? So all of that really varies um, and it depends on um, the, the type of course the student wants to take. It depends on the state. Um, it can you know vary from a couple thousand dollars to more. I know for um, attorney applicants. So if you're applying for a bar exam and you're an attorney applicant, it's even more expensive. Um, so, you know, anywhere from, you know, a couple thousand dollars to five thousand dollars would be what I would say students should kind of think about and prepare for when they are approaching law school as as part of their um, bar prep um, kind of living expenses because you don't want to work during bar prep if at, if at all possible. And then also the fees related to software licensing and applying for the exam. But I would say check with your state bars and your state specific um, providers because those those prices vary and it varies, you know, every year things change and who knows how, you know, the administration of the exams online will affect some of those fees as well. And I guess just to add, I don't know if there are any other questions, but just to add my own personal experience, I had to take the bar exam twice. So I did not pass my first time um, and I felt super, you know, discouraged. But, you know, the best part is being able to pick yourself back up and get back on it and, you know, work even harder. And then it just feels so much better once you do pass that next time. So my point is to, you know, it is a hard, hard exam. Don't get discouraged if when you get to that point, you don't pass your first time because it's, it is, you know, there's a low bar passage rate usually. So a lot of people don't pass, but there are a lot of people who do pass. So just my, exactly. little, my little experience that I had. <laughs> no, that's that's really great to, to share that. And and it really it ties back into, um, you know, I fell down on my bike. <laughs> it's different, but it's the same. And if I had if I had just decided, I mean, I had to get my bike fixed. It was pretty bad. And I was you know, I had to get someone to pick me up because I was really a mess. But I got back on and I think that that, you know, I think that's amazing that you did that and that you learn from the experience and that's what we do. We, you know, we learn from our past and that is where learning happens. And so, um, and, you know, especially certain states, the bar exam pass rate is quite low. Um, and, you know, we're seeing some changes with that, um, with the, the new test. But um, and just some changes with particular states, but it's a hard, it's a really hard test. So it's it's not surprising that that happens. But um, kind of again, remaining positive and just kind of jumping back in and figuring out where you need to to kind of 
make those changes, making those changes, and then um, seeing success. I love that. I love those success stories. Definitely. Yeah, and 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 um, to add to ta what Tally is saying, um, you know, kudos to Tally for trying again. That's what you need to do for even your test and um, whatever you're doing in life. Just keep on trying. Um, and also, mindset is so important for the bar. Like what Lisa was saying, you go in there with a positive mindset. Um, and it will be helpful um, with your your test taking ability. So always try to be positive when you go in there. Yeah, it makes a really big difference. Like I remember comparing my first time going into the bar exam. I had so much. I was so nervous. I couldn't even eat my breakfast that morning. And then the second time I went in, I was like, I'm so excited. And then I got my exam the first day of essays, and I was so excited to see the questions. And I was like, I got this. And I was like smiling while I was taking it. So it really makes a big difference when you go in there with a good mindset and confidence. And you know, that that comes with the preparation that you put into it. You know what I mean? So it comes hand in hand, but it's good. It's all about the mindset. It really is. I agree. All right. Well, are there any well, other questions or should we kind of um wrap yeah it up? there's another question i'm not sure if we answered this already for the essay portion of the bar do we need to discuss all of the topics that you listed or only one of the topics so it's usually one subject at a time in an essay sometimes there's a little bit of overlap it's also state dependent so for the ube the uniform bar exam there's generally one um one essay, per, there's six essays, but there's one topic or subject on each essay. Again, every now and then there's overlap in California though, there's um, overlap of subjects. And so it, it does it does really depend on your state, but um, we have in our course, we have all of the past essays from the state bars. So, and we have outlines of answers and model answers so that students can complete them and practice them, but also just read through them to see how, what they look like. And again, it's just kind of that gathering that information to become more empowered and, and have that strategic mindset of, okay, this is how these questions are asked and this is how the subjects appear and, oh, this is how they might overlap. Um, so we have a lot of workshops and um, kind of trainers within our courses as well to, to show students um, those variations. So we never ever want a test taker to go into the testing environment unprepared. Uh, they really should know exactly what to expect. And I love um, what Tally just said about her second experience, feeling like almost excited and and kind of like a curious mind of like, well, I wonder what they're going to ask me. And I'm like ready for this because, and sometimes the first time around, it wasn't, it wasn't it's usually not that someone isn't prepared or doesn't know the law. It's that sometimes that it, that anxiety can become really hard um, on them and makes it harder for them to perform. But when you have that, when you have that like positive energy and um, almost like I'm ready for this, I'm going to show them what I know kind of um, mentality that really helps. I think that really helps. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have, oh, Jared, you have a question. What's your question? Would you recommend practicing bar in um, different states? Pra practic practicing the bar? Like taking the bar law, in different states? Like practicing law in different states. So it really depends on what kind of law you want to practice. So there's certain practice areas um, where it's nice to have kind of a, a, a bar um, license in multiple states. Now with the uniform bar exam, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, I also would say that once you become licensed, after you practice for a certain amount of time, there are um, rules around reciprocity, meaning that you know if I'm licensed here in Washington state, I can apply to let's say Oregon, which is a bordering state, and I don't need to take the bar, I just need to kind of go through, jump through a couple other hoops, like pay them some money and apply um, by filling out an application. Um, so there are ways to practice and be licensed in multiple jurisdictions without actually taking the bar exam in every jurisdiction. Now, if you want to take a bar exam, if you want to, to do that, like be licensed in two jurisdictions, um, you know, in the same year, then 
you would take one bar in the winter and one bar in the summer and then um, be licensed in that in that jurisdiction for that year. Usually there's a practice requirement for reciprocity. So you have to practice for three to five years or five to seven years, depending on the state. Um, so it's really it's really personal and you know kind of individualized in terms of would you want to practice in multiple states? Um, it's not always necessary uh, for to have a, uh, an engaging legal career in order to do that. Um, but there are ways in order, um, there are ways to do that without actually sitting for kind of a full exam. Right. Yeah, and, and Jared, that's an excellent question too. Just for an example, for me, um, I took the California bar and so I'm licensed in California, but I'm also trying to be licensed in Texas. And so what I did was I went to uh, the website of the state bar for Texas and that's for Texas, they call it the Texas Board of Law Examiners. Um, and then I looked at the um, different requirements what I need to do um, because each state might not um, require me to take the bar. Luckily for Texas, because I qualified for the different um, requirements that they have so that I don't have to take the bar. So I was lucky enough that I don't have to take the bar to be licensed in Texas. All I have to do is follow the directions they have and the documents and the requirements that they want me to prove to them that I satisfy. And so that's what I did. I gave them all the documents and everything is online. They just tell me apply online and upload your documents online. And once that's done, they usually also do uh, a moral character investigation because as attorneys, they want to make sure that we're ethical and that, um, you know, we're following the law because we're supposed to be helping, um, you know, uh, helping people with the law. So, so after I filled out my application and um, uploaded the documents, they, they are now doing the moral character investigation um, on me. So after I pass that, um, um, then I will be licensed in both Texas and California. So that's just an example of how that works. Yeah, and to add on what Catherine is saying, I'm actually writing in the chat. I'm currently looking into the process of getting barred in Wyoming. So I don't know exactly what the steps are. I might actually have to take the bar exam again. So, cause it's a UBE state versus MBE state. So I'm gonna have to look into that, but I'll keep you guys posted on that. If I do have to retake the bar, it'd be kind of exciting. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. There's um, three more questions. Um, they, uh, they were asking that, uh, they're wondering how to be able to contact you or how would any of them be able to contact you and ask for suggestions or guidance because they're from other states? Um, well, on the screen right now is Diana's um, email and you can always contact Diana and contact me through that. Um, I am happy to answer questions and so is Diana. Um, Diana is um, a very great resource for the California exam, um, but also works with students from other states. Um, and we have a full team, we would love to help. Great. Um, I think, oh, and just this last question about Rhea, how did you guys deal with the anxiety and stress you had while studying and taking the bar exam? And that's a great question. I think we've kind of touched on that. It is, it all starts with mindset. I think that's the root of it and keeping a consistent routine, study schedule, sleeping well, exercising, that all totals into leading into your good mental health. And of course we, you know, I still had anxiety and stress and my first time going in, like I mentioned, I was super anxious, couldn't eat my breakfast and I could kind of, you know, it radiated into my test taking ability. So it really is super important. That's like the number one thing on top of actually learning the material is to keep that good mindset and keep that routine consistency. Um, and that way you'll deal with that anxiety and stress, I think. Yeah, I agree with Tally and, um, you know, especially that it, it will be normal to have anxiety and stress. I was anxious and stressed, especially when I started the, the bar preparation. Um, I 
put in the chat that uh, you know I prepared for three months. So basically, what happens is you graduate from law school, um, and so on the day of the graduation, you say goodbye to all your friends and family and say, "I'll see you in three months after I take the bar exam," because you will not have time to socialize and um, you know and 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 do a lot of things that you 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 had to do leisurely, and that's okay because you know what it's such a short period of your of the time in your life it's just three months until you you take the bar um and so you just i just focused on it for three months um and so at the beginning the first two three weeks of preparing for the bar i was anxious because i didn't know what to expect um but as i progressed your anxiety and stress will will lower down because you're seeing your progress and you're seeing that you're actually preparing. And part of your preparation is trying to lower your anxiety and stress. And um, I actually have a, um, a tip for, for, for all of you. Um, you know, as a lawyer, um, one of the things that you will um, learn is how to control your, um, your, your heart rate. Because when you're in front of the jury or when you're in front of the judge or when you're doing work um, or when you're in front of your client, you'll always feel anxious. So Tally and I still feel anxious um, while, you know, when we're doing our, our legal work. And what you, well, what I always try to think of is I need to figure out how to slow down my heart rate because if I'm anxious, then I'm not gonna be able to think what to tell to the judge, how to argue, you right? And so you're gonna start to practice that. Um, and how do I do that? By breathing in and out, taking deep breaths before I go in front of the judge, you know, of course I don't do it in front of the judge. I probably will go to the, to the bathroom and take deep breaths and then say, I'm prepared. I know what I, I prepared the night before. I know what I need to do. So that's the same with the bar. You take deep breaths before you practice or any test that you have in middle school, high school, or in college, and then take the test and say, I'm ready for it. Captain, that's great advice because honestly, it sounds so simple, but really coming back to that breath, it really grounds you and you'll be like, okay, you slow down your heart rate and you're able to think clearly because once that the breathing, you get tight breathing, you can't think straight. Like that would happen to me when I was in law school because I'd have so much stress. So it's all about coming back to the breath, taking five deep breaths and just chilling, you know? All right. It Great. looks like that's all the questions. Any other questions, last minute um, questions? Um, and then we'll tell you uh, about our next legal chat next month. So, yeah, our next legal chat, what's the date for that, Catherine? It's on March 20th. That's a Saturday as usual. It's going to be at 10.30 a.m. our usual time. And the next legal chat is all about financial aid and scholarships. And we will have the University of San Diego School of Law um, who talked to us uh, at the last legal chat, chat last month about the application process and admissions. So now they will talk about the law school um, financial aid and scholarships. And uh, for uh, to tell you the truth, guys, I'm very excited about that too because law school is uh, very expensive. And I wish I knew where to find these scholarships and financial aid at that time. But remember, I took the, I, I was in law school 15 years ago. So there was no internet yet. And, and there's no webinars. I know I feel so old, Ria. <laughs> I see you laughing. But now that you have webinars, take advantage of all the information. So we'll have that March 20th, 10.30 a.m all about financial aid and scholarships. And Tally and I will post on social media the Zoom meeting ID for that so you can register beforehand. Yes. I know it's gonna be very beneficial. Everyone's gonna love this session, so yes. But thank you so much to our guest speakers, Lisa. You were really inf informative. We all appreciate you being here. And Diana, you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. And I wish all of you 
luck in your learning journeys, whether it's on the, the path to the bar exam or in other directions. I know that you can all do it. And um, I hope you got something out of this presentation. And um, again, thanks for having me. Yeah, we will all sign out now and uh, please check out our, our prior recordings um, in our link in bio. Tally has it there in, our, in her link and I also have it in my link. Um, it, on, in our Instagram. Um, we have prior recordings about our individual journeys um, in becoming a lawyer. We also have prior recordings about all about the LSAT. Um, we saw a lot of questions about the LSAT. So please feel free to look at that. We also have prior recording about law school admissions um, and process and uh, more to come. So just keep on looking at that link in bio. We'll have future recordings for you all. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your Saturday. We appreciate you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa and Diana, if you don't mind just staying as everyone um, uh, have a rest, uh, great Saturday. Bye everyone. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye.